Hello, everyone. Bon vendredi, tout le monde. Hello, everyone. I'd like to start today by speaking about new measures affecting Canadian travels. Before going into detail, I'd like to clarify a few things and give you a few, remind, a few reminders. And everyone needs to understand the facts. First of all, for nearly a year now, Canada's borders have been closed to foreign travelers. What that means is that since last March, a French traveler or an American traveler cannot enter Canada for non-essential reasons. Moreover, we have a two-week compulsory, compulsory quarantine period that is required of travelers, and we now demand that a negative test result be provided for the return. The American government has just announced measures that are similar to what we took last March. Second of all, based on the data we have available, fewer than 2% of COVID-19 cases are linked to Canadians coming back to the country. This is proof that our current measures are working. However, as I've already said, even one case is a case too many, particularly now we must that we must take into account new variants of the virus today we are therefore announcing additional new measures to prevent these new variants from entering the country you should know that our experts and scientists are very very closely tracking these variants we are taking this situation extremely seriously know also that we will always work to protect our part to keep ourselves our loved ones and our neighbors safe that's every person every business working together and now canada's air carriers stepping up to protect canadians too the government and canada's main airlines have agreed to suspend service to sun destinations right away Air Canada, WestJet, Sunwing, and Air Transat are cancelling air service to all Caribbean destinations and Mexico starting this Sunday up until April 30th. They will be making arrangements with their customers who are currently on a trip in these regions to organize their return flights. I'd like to acknowledge the leadership of Air Canada, WestJet, Sunwing, and Air Transat in making this commitment to suspend flights and be such strong partners in the fight to curb the spread of COVID-19 and its variants. We appreciate the work the Canadian Airlines and their frontline workers have done to make air travel safer and to bring Canadians home when this pandemic struck last spring. With the challenges we currently face with COVID-19, both here at home and abroad, we all agree that now is just not the time to be flying. By putting in place these tough measures now, we can look forward to a better time when we can all plan those vacations. Our government is committed to the safe restart and recovery of the Canadian travel and tourism sector as soon as conditions approve, ideally later this year. As part of this effort, the Government of Canada has committed to work with the major airlines on the future relationship between testing and quarantine requirements. This will enable the safe, gradual return to international air travel grounded in science and evidence. On top of these flight cancellations, we're bringing in other measures as well. Starting next week, all international passenger flights must land only at the following four airports, Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, and Montreal. In addition to the pre-boarding test we already acquire, as soon as possible in the coming weeks, we will be introducing mandatory PCR testing at the airport for people returning to Canada. Travelers will then have to wait for up to three days at an approved hotel for their test results at their own expense, which is expected to be more than $2,000. Those with negative test results will then be able to quarantine at home under significantly increased surveillance and enforcement. Those with 
positive tests will be immediately required to quarantine in designated government facilities to make sure they're not carrying variants of potential concern. We will also, in the coming weeks, be requiring non-essential travelers to show a negative test before entry at the land border with the U.S. And we're working to stand up additional testing requirements for land travel. Today, I can announce that as of Sunday, flights between Canada and southern destinations, specifically the Caribbean and the Mexico, will be suspended until April 30th. Air Canada, WestJet, Sunwing and Air Transit have agreed to be part of the solution to protect the health and safety of Canadians. Moreover, as quickly as possible in February, we will be adding a second additional compulsory test at the airport for arriving passengers. As passengers await the results of that test, they will be required to wait in quarantine at their expense in a supervised hotel. That expense will be $2,000 per traveler. These tests if these tests are negative, the travelers may remain at home in quarantine up to 14 days with increased surveillance. Tests, anyone with a positive test will be re sent to a re uh, designated government facilities so that they do not so that we can ensure they are not do not have the new variant. There are various logical and other reasons that force us to take these decisions which are not made lightly. We will always take a rigorous approach to make informed, effective decisions that take into account all factors and their consequences. We have known since the beginning of the crisis you have known since the beginning of this crisis, rather, that my priority is to protect Canadians. We must continue to work together. No one wants political battles because of the pandemic. With regard to the vaccine, on Wednesday, I spoke to Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Commission. She confirmed that measures taken by Europe will not affect the delivery of vaccine deliveries by Pfizer and Moderna to Canada. Affecting many countries, including Canada, for the next shipment of the Moderna vaccine, which arrives next week. We will receive 78% of the expected amount, translating to 180,000 doses. I want to be clear. We will always share the most accurate information we have, but in the short term, those numbers can fluctuate. But as global production continues to pick up, there will be more stability in the system. And most importantly, this temporary delay doesn't change the fact that we will still receive 2 million doses of the Moderna vaccine as planned before the end of month, M March, as we've been saying for months. On vaccines, I had another call with the global CEO of Pfizer, Dr. Albert Bourla, who confirmed yet again that we are still on track to receive 4 million doses of their vaccine before the end of March. We also talked about Canada receiving more doses ahead of schedule starting in the spring. We'll have more details to share on that next week. Production lines around the globe are adapting to high demand from every country. We are focused day in and day out on getting a vaccine to every Canadian who wants one by the end of September, and we are very much on track to do just that. Since the beginning of this pandemic, our priority has been protecting you and your family. And just like that means securing vaccines, it also means making sure that kids are safe at school. I've had the chance to drop in on virtual classrooms across the country, from Edmonton to Miramichi. I've been reminded about how just, just how resilient kids are. But that doesn't mean it isn't tough for them, too. Emily at St. Martha's in Kingston told me that school is hard these days because of COVID. To Emily and her friends in Mrs. Au's class and every kid out there listening, you're doing a great job, so keep it up. With this second wave, your schools need support to keep you safe, protect your teachers, and make sure you and your friends 
can continue learning wherever you are. So today, I have some important news to share with you. We've now reached agreements with all provinces and territories for the second installment of federal funding through the Safe Return to Class Fund. This $1 billion investment will go towards everything from more sanitizer to better ventilation for classrooms to support for online learning and remote classes. Bien sûr, l'éducation est de compétence. Of course, education is a provincial jurisdiction, but as I said to the premiers when we announced the Safe Return to Class Fund last year, it's a principle that we will always respect. Provinces and territories will be able to, to use the support that we provide through this fund to help schools, teachers, and students during these difficult times. Already, the first installment in the fall made a great difference to the children and schools across the country. Staff, students, volunteers across the country, you're doing a remarkable job. The lessons you're teaching our kids, resilience, critical thinking, compassion, will serve them and our country for the rest of their lives. Things will get back to normal and until then, we will keep having your back. Au Canada, <clears throat> peu importe votre... In Canada, no matter what your age, no matter where you live, no matter who you are, every Canadian deserves to feel safe. Last September, the tragic death of Joyce Echequan was a reminder how ingrained systemic racism still is in our society. It is unacceptable that there are members of the, our Indigenous communities that uh, are subjected to racism in our healthcare systems. Yesterday, another national dialogue took place. Participants committed once again to eliminating systemic racism in the healthcare system. During these conversations, representatives from the Indigenous communities, education, the provinces and territories, and healthcare, among others, were able to express their opinion and offer solutions to this problem. I would like to emphasize the work of Minister Miller, who yesterday launched the discussions to co-develop a uh, measures based on uh, distinctions for Indigenous people. They will help all Indigenous peoples. It is time, high time, that we put end to all systemic racism in our healthcare system in Canada, and we must continue to work together to do so. And systemic racism in our healthcare systems, we also have to address in our country. Far too many women and girls were already facing violence, and this pandemic has only made things worse. Since the beginning of this crisis, we've provided $100 million to organizations and shelters in support of victims of gender-based violence. And there's still so much more work to be done. Last week, ministers from different orders of government responsible for the status of women endorsed the joint declaration for a Canada free of gender-based violence. This joint declaration affirms a common vision to put a stop to violence against women and girls and is an important step in developing a national action plan to end gender-based violence in Canada. I want to thank Minister Monsef and all ministers involved for their important work. While we fight against gender-based violence, we must also continue to fight other forms, all other forms of violence and hatred. Four years ago tonight, a Islamic, uh, anti-Islamic, is anti-Muslim terrorist attacked the Quebec mosque and caused victims there. The communities across Canada for, to Muslim communities across Canada, I know this is still painful to all Canadians. We are in, all Canadians are in solidarity with you. We are all united to defend our values of diversity and inclusion. What we do counts, what we say counts as well. 
racist comments, disinformation, trolling, online and elsewhere. All of these actions have genuine consequences. We must be aware of this. We must continue to act against this. We have taken several concrete measures in the last years to f in this fight. We have protected people at their places of worship. We have developed initiatives to fight online hate. And we have also banished assault rifles to prevent further incidents from reoccurring. In Quebec City was an unthinkable tragedy. We cannot and we will not ever forget. January 29th will officially become the National Day of Remembrance of the Quebec City Mosque Attack and of Action Against Islamophobia. Le 29 janvier deviendra officiel. 29th of January will officially become the National Day of Remembrance of the Quebec Mosque Attack and of Action Against Islamophobia. We will honour the victims and we will recommit ourselves to fighting the discrimination and hate that took them from us. No one should ever be afraid because of the way they pray, not in Canada and not anywhere around the world. Today and always, we must stand strong and united because that will always be our path forward. I think that's something we've all been reminded of over the last year as Canadians have come together to fight this once in a generation crisis. Cases are slowly decreasing because everyone is doing their part. So thank you and keep it up. I also want to thank the many people who are making sure that no one gets left behind, no matter where they live. Together, we've overcome the vast geography and the tough winter of this country to get more than 10% of the adult population of the territories already vaccinated. It just goes to show that we have the plan and the team to get this done. More vaccines are on the way. Spring is coming and together we're going to get through this. Thank you, Prime Minister. We'll now turn the phone for a question. One question and one follow-up. Operator. Thank you. Merci. First question, Charlie Pinkerton, iPolitics. Line open. Good morning, Prime Minister. Uh, we found out earlier this week that it was only a matter of days after the National Research Council's vaccine partnership with CanSino was announced that your government found out that China's government was effectively blocking the deal by not issuing the proper documentation to allow for the initial ingredients to leave Beijing's airport. We only learned of the holdup about a month and a half later when who was supposed to be the lead on the clinical trials for CanSino's vaccine here in Canada mentioned it while speaking to the House Committee. Later in July, you said your government was working with the Chinese government to ensure that work could continue in an uninterrupted fashion. What were you hearing from China's government about this over the summer? And what about Canada's dealings with China over the last two plus years led you to believe that there would be any other outcome other than the deal eventually dying as it did? From the very beginning of this pandemic, uh, we demonstrated that we were going to work uh, in every way possible to keep Canadians safe, whether that was in bringing in record amounts of PPE or developing domestic capacity, uh, whether that was working uh, with all sorts of different companies and scientists and researchers on supporting vaccine research uh, so we could get uh, more doses for Canadians. We were ready to knock on any door and work uh, in a focused way to get Canadians the support they needed. That's exactly what we did. Uh, obviously, uh, the uh, relationship and partnership with CanSino, which had been very effective uh, in developing an Ebola vaccine uh, a number of years ago, um, wasn't one that panned out. We kept trying to see if it could be made to work. Uh, but that is part of why we made, we made such a concerted effort uh, to sign more deals with more potential vaccine makers around the world than any other country uh, to arrive at a point where we have more doses per person uh, than any country in the world uh, that we have secured for Canadians. Obviously, we kept working every different direction we could because Canadians expected us to be doing everything possible that might help save lives and get us through this pandemic. 
a follow-up, Charlie? Yeah, um, well, well, this deal itself, part of your government uh, had any other vaccine deals in place. So I guess I'm wondering, why wasn't your government more transparent about how, how this was going over the summer? Um, and were you stalling uh, just before the other uh, deals were reached? We continued to work in parallel with many different companies and potential producers of vaccines. Uh, we uh, kept working even on uh, deals that looked like they might not be working out because we knew that making sure we had every opportunity to give Canadians whatever vaccines ended up being successful uh, was our priority. So we kept working away and trying to make sure that we would get the best possible outcomes for Canadians. And that's exactly what we've ended up with, with more deals with more different vaccine producers than any other country. And indeed, more potential doses per person than any other country in the world. That is the work we did and we continued to do throughout last year. Merci pour cette question. Thank you. Merci. Next question from Le Devoir. Question. Hello, Mr. Trudeau. I'd like to go back to today's announcement. First of all, you are announcing that the airliners will be cancelling certain flights. Will there be any financial compensation? Did your government obtain, uh, offer any financial compensation? And second of all, we learned earlier that there was a danger in suspending flights because they're chain. What will be the effect of this decision then? Answer. First of all, we've be, we're in ongoing talks with our airlines. We are having very good discussions. We recognize to what extent it is important for Canada to a healthy, competitive, successful airline industry once we get through this pandemic. And we are here to support airline companies. We recognize what they have done and we thank them for making this decision to protect Canadians and to prevent flights to, uh, leave, from leaving to Mexico and the Caribbean in the next few months. Now is not the time to fly and we will be continuing to work with the airline companies to ensure that the airline industry is healthy after this pandemic. I'm sure there will be a lot of Canadians who will want to take their vacation abroad once public health conditions allow. As for supply chains, we are always ensuring that our supply chains remain robust with regard to these chains. There are not a tremendous number of commodities that will be affected by the cancellation of these flights to uh, sun destinations, but we are still, of course, monitoring the situation to make sure that essential flights can still take place. We continued to work uh, with the airline industry in Canada. We know that it's going to be extremely important to have a flourishing, thriving, competitive uh, airline industry uh, in Canada uh, once this pandemic is done. I know uh, a lot of Canadians are going to want to start traveling again as soon as the public, uh, public health uh, requirements allow it. Um, and we need to make sure that our airlines are uh, healthy and be able to uh, respond to the demand that Canadians will bring once we're through this pandemic. Uh, that's why the conversations with these airlines continue, but I really do want to take a moment uh, to salute and thank the leadership of Canada's uh, main airlines uh, for having taken this step to keep Canadians safe uh, during the, uh, the heart of this, uh, this difficult wave of the pandemic. We, uh, revenir Follow-up question. I'd like to go back to this quarantine period, three-day quarantine period, a compulsory one for travelers arriving. You say it could cost $2,000. It seems awfully expensive. Could you talk about this amount? Does that include the cost of the, would the tra if ever there was a positive test, uh, travelers would have to go to a public health institution? And what about the people who are staying 14 days in quarantine? Answer. It's a very good question. We will have more details in the coming days. But the main lines of this uh, decision 
are that anyone who comes back to Canada from non-essential travel will have to go undertake an immediate test at, upon their arrival. We will have to go uh, to private tests. Obviously, we don't want to prevent other Canadians from being tested because of these travelers. So travelers will pay for these tests, and they will be required to wait up to three days to receive the results of these airport tests. They will be waiting at approved uh, Health Canada approved hotels because of the extra measures that these hotels must take to ensure that their workers are safe as they uh, have these quarantine travelers, there will be extra expenses, of course. There's the cost of the test. There's the cost of the three hotel nights, nights in a hotel rather, which will have to be paid in advance. That will amount to about $2,000. Of course, if there's a negative result after two, day, two days, the travelers will be able to return uh, home where they will be able to finish their 14-day quarantine under strict measures with increased surveillance. If ever they have a positive test result, they will be required to go to a government uh, quarantine area where they will finish their 14 days of quarantine. This will not necessarily be at their expense. They will have already spent $2,000 for the three-day hotel expense, which is required of every traveler coming back from abroad. Merci. Next question, Ryan Tumulty, National Post, line open. Yeah, good morning, sir. Uh, I'm wondering um, why, what's driving your decision to focus this intently on travel? Is it, is it the variance? Because as you, as you said, and as the data shows, travel is not a big driver of cases inside Canada's border. Is it the variance that's driving this concern? Uh, we know that these variants uh, represent a real challenge. We've seen uh, public health modeling that shows uh, what happens if these variants do take hold in Canada. We saw uh, that one travel case uh, resulted in uh, many, many cases of the UK variant uh, in and around Barrie and, and uh, uh, expanding. Uh, we know that just one case of the variant that comes in uh, could cause significant challenges, and that's why we need to take extra measures. Uh, yes, it is extremely uh, low, the percentage of cases that are traced back to international travel, uh, but it's not zero. And making sure we are doing everything we can, which includes uh, mandatory testing on arrival and uh, a mandatory three-day uh, hotel stay uh, while they're waiting for the results of that test so that anyone who's positive uh, gets into a government quarantine center uh, where they can be closely monitored for variants uh, is an important step to take on top of all the other steps that we've already taken now demanding. Uh, the ban on all foreign nationals in terms of uh, non-essential travel that's been in place since March, along with the quarantine measures that have been in place since March, measures that just now the U.S. is adopting. And we know some très préoccupé. Yes, we're very concerned by the uh, arrival of variants of this virus. We saw what happened in Barrie, Ontario. One single case of the variant spread very quickly in the community. So we must do everything to prevent the arrival of these variants. The elimination of non-essential trips down south, these increased measures to detect COVID-19 at the airport, and a quarantine period in a hotel near the airport while awaiting test results. Those are all measures that will help us. We are putting a system in place that will allow us to catch as many of these new variants as possible. With the head of Pfizer, uh, today, were you able to come to some understanding on this five dose versus six dose per vial issue? And did he commit to providing four million doses, even if Health Canada rules there are only five doses in the vial? 
And I'm also wondering if the Moderna reductions will extend to just next week or throughout the month of February. No, thank you uh, for your questions. No, in my conversation uh, with the head of I Pfizer, um, we talked uh, about the question of five doses versus six, versus six doses. Uh, Health Canada is right now analyzing uh, the, the uh, state of uh, extraction of doses uh, in Canada, uh, the necessary techniques, training, equipment necessary, and they will make uh, the decision to ensure uh, the, the right decision uh, on the five doses versus six doses question. Uh, but I got assurance uh, from the head of uh, uh, Pfizer that we uh, would be, uh, we are continuing to be on track to receive uh, the doses committed to uh, by the end of March uh, as planned, as we've been saying from the beginning. Uh, and furthermore, uh, he made uh, very positive and encouraging comments about the possibility of bringing forward doses from Q4 to Q3, from Q3 to Q2. Uh, but those are things that we'll be able to talk about uh, in more detail once we have uh, better confirmation next week. Um, in regards to Moderna, uh, we are very preoccupied uh, with, uh, with that supply chain. Uh, no, sorry, we are, uh, of course, watching closely on that supply chain, but the announcement Moderna has made uh, uh, on a reduction of about 20% uh, across the board on deliveries uh, for this coming uh, week is only for this shipment and should be returned to normal uh, on the next shipment. David Aiken, Global News. Good morning, Prime Minister. Um, I want to come to these travel restrictions. Even before today's announcement, we had restrictions on mobility. Public Health Agency of Canada officials have been briefing the airline industry and others saying, even if we all get vaccinated by September, you should not assume those mobility restrictions are going to disappear. Can you confirm that? And can you tell Canadians, you know, who are making all the sacrifice in October, in November, Will international travel resume any shape, way, or form? What's it look like? What are we all doing this for once we all get vaccinated? We're doing this to keep as many Canadians alive and healthy uh, as we can through this pandemic. Uh, we're taking difficult measures now so that we can get through this quicker so that uh, we uh, have less damage to our economy, to our industries, to our workers, to our uh, lives. Uh, this is something that Canada is focused on and that's why we've brought in uh, so many different restrictions on international travel from uh, last year because we knew that keeping Canadians safe needed to be our first order of business, not just uh, for the health and safety of Canadians, but for the health and safety of our economy as well. If we want to come roaring back strongly, uh, we need to make sure we are minimizing the disruption and the damage done uh, by cases across this country. In regards to when we're going to get to travel again, uh, when things are going to go back to normal, that's the question we've, we've been asking ourselves every month uh, uh, since last March. When is this going to be over? Um, we're going to keep doing the things that will end it as quickly as possible. And that means staying home, staying safe, getting vaccines here as quickly as possible. Uh, what Canada will look like this summer, what Canada will look like this fall, we certainly hope that there will be far fewer restrictions, that we will be able to be back to uh, a more regular life. Whether uh, our international allies and partners will be at that same place is something we're going to have to look at carefully uh, before we reopen international travel, uh, before we get back to normal. Um, we're working in a concerted way, as focused uh, uh, on this as, uh, as possible, to make sure we get through as quickly as possible. And uh, that's, uh, what, uh, that's all we can do, and that's what we're continuing to do. Uh, I'm just looking perhaps a little more precision on the when question. So as public health officials, your cabinet thinks on the when, you'll be looking at a variety of factors, I assume. Case counts, uh, distribution of rapid testing kits, all sorts of things. Can you be a little more precise saying once we hit these sorts of markers, we can then start thinking about resuming some sort of normalcy. Can you be more precise on that? Well, I, I, let me give you an example right now. We're, we're very much looking at what the spring budget is going to look like and uh, how much or what elements of a recovery stimulus we put in to that budget will depend very much on where we are and where we think we are in terms of the economy reopening, things getting back to normal. There are many, many different things we're looking at in terms of uh, how we get back to normal. Not all of them uh, are uh, in 
our direct control as a, as a government uh, or even as a society. For example, the effectiveness of vaccines in preventing reinfections or preventing spread of COVID-19. There are many things that are still being looked at and we will always bring in all those factors to make the right decisions for Canadians and for our economy. We said from the beginning that we'd have Canadians backs and we'd get through this uh, the best way possible. That's exactly what we're on track to doing. Good morning, Prime Minister. Kevin Gallagher from CTV National News. You're calling these tougher travel restrictions, but you know, for weeks, premiers have been asking for something even stricter, a total ban on international travel, um, something the opposition parties seem keen to support, especially with the new variants that surely aren't all coming from sunshine destination. So why not have stricter measures even with travel? And in fact, why isn't your government acting sooner on this? We have some of the stricter, res strictest restrictions on travel of uh, any uh, of uh, our allied countries around the world. And today with these further measures, we're announcing uh, e even, even more measures. They're going to keep Canadians safe. Uh, the mandatory testings on arrival for anyone arriving in uh, only our four main international airports, the mandatory uh, wait time in a local uh, approved hotel uh, for uh, the results of that test, uh, the cancellation of flights uh, to sun destinations and to Mexico. Uh, these are things uh, that will significantly reduce uh, the risk of importation of new variants across the country. But we, as always, have a multi-layered approach uh, that works with partners to ensure uh, both uh, feasibility and uh, maximum safety for Canadians in a way that is responsible. Uh, and that's exactly the balance that we've struck. Hello, Prime Minister. Mike Blanchfield, Canadian Press. Um, some questions on the contracts with the uh, different vaccine makers. The United States has released redacted contracts with vaccine suppliers months ago. The European, the European Commission has asked its suppliers to release the contracts, and AstraZeneca has apparently done that today. The Commission also says it wants to publish all of its contracts in the near future. Why is Canada insisting on keeping the details of these contracts from the public, from the taxpayers who are spending the money, uh, what, is, what is your thinking to that? Are, is it pressure from the companies? What's at play here? Our priority every step of the way has been getting uh, the largest number of doses as quickly as possible from as many different companies as possible for Canadians. That has driven us every step of the way. It drove us to sign more contact, contracts with more companies than uh, most of our allies. Certainly, uh, it drove us to secure more doses per person than just about any other country in the world. And that thinking is what drove us you know, furthest and, and fastest uh, every step of the way in negotiating and signing contracts with uh, various vaccine companies. Uh, at the same time, we have uh, always uh, tried to be as transparent as possible, both uh, on uh, on what we've spent uh, globally on vaccines, but also uh, more and more details as they are made available. We will continue to work uh, with vaccine companies uh, around the world in order to uh, share as many details as possible with Canadians. But every step of the way, our focus is first and foremost on getting the help to Canadians they need as quickly as possible, and we're not going to risk jeopardizing that. Hi, Prime Minister Tom Perry, CBC. Um, has Moderna told you what's causing uh, this disruption? And have you received assurances from the company that it's only the one shipment uh, that's going to be reduced? Uh, I spoke with uh, the head of Moderna uh, last week, I believe, or earlier this week, it all blends. He talked about uh, certain uh, concerns they had around uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, manufacturing process. Um, this uh, momentary reduction uh, in production uh, is uh, something that they've told us is only going to be for this one shipment at this point. It's just a 20% reduction. We're still going to get uh, uh, over uh, 170,000 Moderna in this current shipment. Uh, but uh, we know that uh, this is something we're going to have to keep watching very, very closely. We still remain very confident we're going to get all uh, the doses that we secured from Moderna uh, by the end of March as expected, as planned. We will continue to work closely with them. But again, the numbers on vaccine arrivals in this new process where industrial processes are being stood up around the world from, from scratch, 
for these vaccines, we always expected them to fluctuate a little bit, which is why we work so hard to, first of all, establish good relations with these companies, uh, to sign deals and contracts with these uh, companies early on to have a larger range of potential vaccines for Canadians and um, where uh, we are confident that we are going to be able to hit the big milestones that we laid out to Canadians. Uh, Getting doses uh, in December was uh, an extra, was a bonus, was something we were able to do that got us uh, to, uh, to stand up our supply chains in a more efficient way. But it wasn't something that we had necessarily planned for. It was something we were able to work for and get. Uh, getting a, a number of doses uh, in Q1, we had assurances that we were going to be able to get six million doses of vaccines by the end of March, and we are still very much on track for that. And that is the number that we have consistently shared with Canadians, and that is the number that we are going to hit despite momentary delays and fluctuations that are hitting countries and productions around the world. We also remain very much on track to getting every Canadian who wants to get vaccinated, vaccinated by September. That is something uh, that uh, I can reassure Canadians on. That's what we are working on. Uh, we are going to get there. En français, mais juste sur la partie sur... Uh, the interpreter can answer. When I spoke to the CEO of Moderna a few days ago, and today as well, we were told that there is a production delay that have caused that has caused this temporary reduction in the number of doses sent this week, a 20% reduction. That affects this uh, production delay is affecting all their clients across the world, and things will be not back to normal for the shipments following this week. We will be able to meet our uh, March 31st target for Moderna doses. We expect to re receive the doses promised by the deadline. Question, Radio-Canada. For travelers coming from abroad, they'll spend three days in a hotel, then they can, if they have a negative test, they can spend the rest of their quarantine at home. You say there will be increased surveillance measures. What is an example of that? And who will be doing this increased surveillance? Who will pay for it? Answer, for the increased surveillance measures for the mandatory 14-day quarantine day period, we, the federal government, has hired a private security company we have our own uh, personnel as well. And since last March, local police forces have had the power and the responsibility to uh, take part in these surveillance measures. The Vancouver Police Force, the Ontario Police Force, the OPP, and others have been very active in helping with this, uh, sur this surveillance measures. We hope to continue to be able to work with all the police forces across the country. The idea is to be able to keep a close eye on people who are required to have a to spend a 14-day quarantine period following a uh, a three a, a negative test upon arrival to surveillance and enforcement measures of mandatory quarantines. Uh, from uh, last, uh, last March, uh, we've been working with police of jurisdiction who have the authority uh, to ensure uh, local police forces, uh, provincial police forces, uh, have the authority to follow up on quarantine uh, requirements. We've seen police uh, from Vancouver uh, to uh, the Ontario Police to elsewhere uh, stepping up and being part of this monitoring of quarantine. Uh, we are increasing uh, the number of calls we're making from the federal government. We're hiring uh, private security firms to help with those follow-up. And of course, there will be a particular focus given on uh, on uh, returning travelers who've uh, gone through the process of, of the three-day uh, test results when they come back.
Pas d'autres questions? Il fait tellement chaud aujourd'hui. Spring is coming, we hear. 